Hello, Acme Science News Now viewers. I am popping in to remind you that Acme Science is running a Kickstarter project. You can find it over at kickstarter.com. Search for Acme Science, or you can find a link to it on acmescience.com. I remind you of this because if you enjoy watching Acme Science News Now, if you want to see more interviews with science researchers about their newest work, say one every other week, then you have to go and support the project. If you don't, you might just find that you won't have any interviews with scientists, and that would really be too bad, because I really want to do it, and I really want you to be able to watch it. So once again, Acme Science Kickstarter. Go support it, please. Hello and welcome to Acme Science News Now. I'm your host, Samuel Hansen, and I have a couple of people here to talk with me today. It's the first time that I've had more than one person on the other end. Uh, and we are going to be talking about clocks, uh, but not, not about time itself, but about how clocks might be useful. So joining me, I have Roxanda Bondarescu and Mihai Bondarescu. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you. The first question that I have for you is why do clocks sometimes run at different speeds? And and not not because, you know, they're miswound, but from a more scientific perspective. Well, this is the essence of general activity. We fall towards the center of the Earth because the Earth bends the space time in such a way that makes time slow down at the surface as compared to farther away. Now, an extreme example of space-time bending is a black hole. If you're looking at the speed of time at the black hole horizon, as seen from here, it's practically stopped. If you had a way to hang a clock right above the horizon of the black hole, infinitely close to the horizon, it would stop completely. Now, maybe a less extreme example would be a neutron star. A neutron star is like a stellar mass object, maybe two solar masses, uh, that fits roughly in the size of London. Now, a few kilometers across, like 10, 10, 15 kilometers. Now, on a neutron star, time would go maybe at half the speed it has here. On Earth, however, the effect is very, very mild. So if you're looking at two clocks, maybe 20 centimeters apart, um, that's the height of a, of a glass of milk, um, you'd be getting maybe a few seconds in the, time of, in the life of the universe. So you'd have to wait an awfully long time for your clocks to run out of sync, at least by microscopic standards, like, say, this clock here. <laughs> but the different flow of time is basically equivalent to saying that gravity exists. So uh, if time wouldn't flow different at the bottom or the top of the clock, that the milk would not stay in the cup. Like, if you're on an international space station, uh, they have trouble eating because they have to fight with their food. Their, their food can, you know, float around because gravity is not as strong as on Earth. Like, the, but, dif the differential rate of, of, of time, the, the difference in the speed of time is crucial to our life. We wouldn't have gravity otherwise. It is very, very important that time doesn't go everywhere at the same rate. Now, the difference is minute. And this is why gravity here is mild as opposed to a black hole. <laughs> um, but it is very important. And for the first time in, in, in history, in the past few years, we've had the technology to actually measure it and measure it on a very, very precise scale. Precise and, and everyday life sort of scale. So uh, I guess the, the next question that would follow from that is what is, I believe it's pronounced the geoid? Yes. Oh, the geoid is essentially the sea level surface. The mean sea level. The mean sea level surface. So the so geoid, uh, yeah, if you, if you had a hypothetical surface that corresponds to the sea level, so that a drop of water placed on the surface would never flow elsewhere, uh, that would be the geoid. So, so how, is, how is that important uh, when it comes to uh, clocks? Clocks measure changes in the gravitational potential. So if you have a clock at the BNC level and you have a clock somewhere else, the, the, the difference in, in the potential difference is, uh, is the difference between the mean sea level and where your other clock is located. So clock, clocks measure potential differences. Or if, you want, so, or, or if you want, all clocks placed at the same potential 
on the same equipotential surface, namely at the sea level, will run, run at the same, same speed. Right. All clocks at sea level plus one meter will, will run at the same speed. All clocks placed at sea level minus 10 meters will run, will run at the same speed. Okay, so, so you could think of this as, as kind of a level where the, the clocks would then all run at the same time. Yeah, the, clo- the level clocks where the clocks will run at the same time, and also uh, the level where the gravitational potential is the same, which is maybe more, more intuitive. Like say, if you have a, a hill, that hill is not an equipotential surface. If you place a ball on the hill, the ball rolls down. Now, if your surface corresponds to the geoid, if you ever place a ball on it, the ball will never roll anywhere. The surface is everywhere as flat as it could be on Earth. If, if I understand your, uh, your research correctly, you are now uh, using... Uh, because we we are interested in what the the geoid is and and we've been trying to to map it because we're human beings and we like to map things and understand things so i if i understand your research correctly you're now uh using clocks to actually map the geoid well we haven't used them yeah what we've been in doing is that we've worked theori- we're theoretical physicists. We work on the theoretical side of things. Okay, so you have shown that you can use map. You can use clocks. Yes, atomic clocks can be used reliably and effectively to provide a reasonable mapping of the geoid that exceeds other achievable standards. Obviously, most of the geoid is is on sea, and on sea, the sea level itself provides the geoid, which is very easy to measure. All you have to do is fly a satellite over the ocean and look where the water is, and you've got your geoid. It's very easy. The problem arises on land, when you don't have the sea level, and you, there's no clear and, and obvious way how to extend it. Well, of course, there, there are ways to measure it, and it has been measured to a reasonable accuracy. All that we've done is that we've shown that you can use um, general relativity, which is something maybe most geophysicists wouldn't think of using. <laughs> um, you can use general relativity to actually improve something that is relevant to everyday life. Now, you may ask, why is the geoid relevant to everyday life? Because do you really care if New Orleans is at sea level or sea level plus two centimeters? Or if it goes from sea level to sea level minus two centimeters? Well, you might, some people might care. And, and um, changes in, in the location of a, of a city or a or building with respect to a sea level or an area may be relevant, may, may be linked to something that's happening underground, may be linked to, to a long-term trend that, that may be of some relevance, or sometimes anomalies in the geoid may be linked to underground structures that's, that may be interesting, like, say, oil or natural gas. Um, like, if you have a region rich in natural gas um, or, or oil, you're looking at a rock that is um, lighter. Yeah, it has lower sure. density. Yeah. It has lower density than the average Earth. And then if you, you, what you're going to have in the geoid is a little bump. The geoid, the Earth in that area will attract things less than it attracts somewhere else. So... And this little bump, if you can see it, then you can think, hey, maybe something interesting down there. And then maybe you can use another, another technology or something else to look closely at it. Or maybe you can drill a hole and see what it is. And atomic clocks can map the geoid quite, precise, quite well and are progressing at an amazing rate. And it is this progress of the atomic clocks that doesn't seem to be stopping in the, in the, in the foreseeable future, that, that makes them a very interesting tool. Because, of course, if you look at our paper, um, what we can do with atomic today is slightly better, but not a world away from what can be done with other methods. However, um, the precision of, of um, atomic clocks has been improving by something like a factor of 10 every decade for the past few decades, and it seems to be going the same way. They seem to keep improving, but there's no there's no hard limit inside. So once once we do have have these atomic clocks that uh, that are so accurate that you can really see a difference between uh, your method and and the previous methods that that are used, say today. How would uh, 
people actually go around to do this measurement that, I mean, could find the geoid, could also identify these uh, structures underneath the Earth as well? Like, well, essentially, you carry it, carry it there somehow. And by carrying it, I mean, put it in your truck, put it in your pocket, uh, put it in your spaceship. Uh, and and all, this, all these options are seriously debated. There is an atomic clock that is going on the International Spaceship, but it's going to map other things, not the geoid. Um, so you want to have it there. You want to have it stationary for long enough for it to, to be able to see the difference in, in, the, in the rate of time flow, um, which, which, it, which does take a while. Um, and you just carry out the measurement. Now, you are probably looking at linking atomic clocks with fiber optic or with, with some other sort of, of link, and uh, it is a, a fairly standard procedure if you want. Just move the thing, have it sit. Um, you want it quiet, of course. You don't want it vibrating. You don't want it, you know. And, and from a theorist perspective, I'm just saying that you're going to stop your truck's engine. But what you're really going to do is probably isolate it and, and, and be nice to it. <laughs> and uh, uh, that should give you the data. Now, of course, we are theorists, and we are assuming that you can have these clocks produced in a large enough number at a low enough price for it to be feasible. Um, yes, that may not be the case now, but probably in 10 years' time, um, I think it's, it's very likely. And, and I'm not talking, I'm, I don't think I'm talking science fiction. I wouldn't be a theorist if I wasn't talking a little bit of science fiction. <laughs> um, because it's a theorist's work to look at things that haven't quite happened yet. Yes, yes, and our, our job is to prove that they are useful. Our job is to show that there is a way, and then hopefully people will walk on that way. Okay, well, I, I certainly hope you are right, and I also uh, now hope that I will one day carry an atomic clock in my pocket. <laughs> <laughs> well, that they may not be so far away. They actually make very small atomic clocks for medical applications. Yeah, atomic clock, portable atomic oh, so clocks do yeah, exist, they do and they exist, can be carried. They can be, you know, the size of my watch. But of course, for unless you multiply by the speed of light, you don't need amazing precisions of ten to the minus eighteen. Uh, so you, they, they go for lower precision that is relevant for for the the study they do. But then it can be very compact. A time measurement. We're, we're able to measure time far better than we can measure any other quantity today. Like, uh, I, maybe some of your readers don't know this, but um, not too many years ago, the meter was redefined in terms of the light travel time. So now, in the international system of units, you don't have... The meter is no longer defined as the length of a stick that sits somewhere, which, which is what it used to be. The meter was defined as the length of a stick that was sitting somewhere. And it had two little marks on it, and, and that was a meter, the distance between those two marks. Well, the meter is no longer that. The meter is now defined as the distance light travels in a certain time. And that time is fairly short. <laughs> uh, but, but that's how the meter is, the meter is defined, and we are better at measuring that very short time using the atomic clocks of many years ago. Um, then we, we are at measuring the, the, the length of a stick. Hey, well, uh, Roxandra and Mihai, thank you so much for coming on Acme Science News Now. It's been a pleasure. Hi, it's been a pleasure. Thank you.